Hello. Right, hopefully everyone can hear me. My name is Vanessa Norwood and I'm Creative Director of the Building Centre. Um, it's a great honour today to welcome Piers Taylor from Invisible Studio uh, to talk as part of our sustainability sessions, which are a series of talks that explore aspects of sustainability in the built environment. Um, this series, we're looking at retrofit projects that aim to reduce carbon emissions while giving existing buildings new life. So Invisible Studio, they're an innovative and award-winning architecture practice founded by Piers Taylor. They work internationally and locally in a variety of fields and at a variety of scales. And their award-winning architecture aims to push boundaries from material research through to wider environmental concerns. And the practice offer a low impact model of architecture where big issues such as climate change are confronted head on. Invisible Studio operates through collaboration, experimentation, research and education. They have particular expertise with timber and have close relationships with the world's leading timber engineers and fabricators and are organizers of the annual Studio in the Woods, which is a place where makers, architects and students collaborate on projects. And today, Piers is gonna be talking about the Moonshine Retrofit. And Piers may be familiar to you all as co-presenter of BBC series, The World's Most Extraordinary Homes, where his drawings bring architectural form to life. The origins of Moonshine go back to 1786 near Bath in the UK, where it was originally a schoolhouse for a large country house nearby. And it was extended in 2002 by Invisible Studio as one of the practice's first buildings and is home to Piers and his family. In the intervening period, the practice has built various other projects on the site, including a studio where Piers is sitting now in the 100 acre woodland that surrounds the house, which Taylor manages alongside the practice. So Piers self-built the original extension, having to carry everything 600 meters along a steep woodland tract before the house had vehicular access. And the original house won the AJ Small Projects Award soon after it was completed. So much has changed since 2002 with knowledge of insula insulation, air tightness, um, and with a desire to future-proof the house and make it as low energy as possible, Piers has recently retrofit retrofitted the house to achieve ex exceptional levels of insulation, air tightness, and autonomy. Um, so I will hand over to you, Piers. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're looking forward to hearing more about this wonderful project. Thanks very much for that, Vanessa. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and begin talking about um, this place that I've been for more than 20 years now and in a way has been a place where I've kind of lived out my proper, uh, I suppose, career, proper practice alongside the sort of slightly homespun experiments that we've done in the woodland that Vanessa described. So we are right now in a woodland that is uh, runs along the top of the valley and drops down to the bottom on the horizon um, opposite in this slide. And that is near Bath, just north of Bath, uh, southwest of the United Kingdom. It's uh, Bath is at the bottom. We are uh, three miles northeast. If you follow that built environment that snakes up to the northeast and then stops, we're above that. It's a kind of illusion of wilderness in some ways. And I studied originally in Sydney and had a yearning to come back to a European city and live close enough to be able to walk in or cycle in, but live near somewhere relatively cosmopolitan. Of course, people in London won't think it is at all, and it, it isn't particularly, but it is. it has a particular quality that I enjoy. But this is a geographical map showing the flat valley, uh, flat hilltops with these water-worn valleys, and there are five valleys that come into Bath. Ours is the one um, where it says Elmhurst Estate, and it goes up uh, then uh, to us. So this is uh, Charmy Down, uh, air, uh, showing the kind of quality of the flatness of the top of these hills. And typically the built form follows the bottoms and we're at the top right. So this is looking from Salisbury Hill next to Charmy Down. Peter, Peter Gabriel obviously wrote about Salisbury Hill, sang about it. And our woods are the ones directly along the horizon, dipping down into the fold just beyond the hill there. 
so this is where I am now in these woods. The house that I'm going to talk about is the one that is in that little clearing in the woods looking straight the way down um, the valley and the trees that we're surrounded by tumble down to the bottom and they're a kind of mixed uh, broadleaf woodland typically. As Vanessa says, the house was part of an old uh, country estate that the house, if you follow the Lime Avenue on the right hand side, uh, sat at the end of that axis, was knocked down. Our house was a schoolhouse. Uh, people historically were educated on an estate and the old house was knocked down in the late 60s when things were sort of uh, scavenged for you know things they could sell off and build big big houses were sort of semi-worthless the woodland was sold off and the reason i'm telling you this i guess is that we for 10 years when we bought this place had to we only had a little half acre slot of woodland where a is red a my cursor doesn't sort of work when i'm presenting so there is a red a on the on the map where on the photograph where the house is and we had to park uh, where it, uh, uh, at where the sort of buildings are at the end of that drive, where the old house was, and walk down through the woodland to a tiny little castellated building that was falling down. So this was the old schoolhouse. Um, we bought it for the cost of a sort of two up, two down, one up, one down in our local village. And um, I think what was interesting about the house was that it had very thick walls, but it had begun to fall down the hill because it was in the shadow of this big ash tree. And it just had a complete denial of where it was from an architectural perspective. It had no engagement with its site at all. And we moved in when we had one child, we have four now, and very quickly we needed more space. And we didn't have very much money, so we had to do something that was as cheap as possible and was built by ourselves, carrying everything, you know, uh, half a kilometre along this very steep, small woodland track. Bottom of the garden as it was then, looking down towards Bath and little Salisbury Hill. That's the sort of context from Salisbury Hill, uh, just to sort of show what this sort of built pattern of Bath is like, a couple of miles from the house. And then, you know, this is looking back, uh, looking out across our valley, directly opposite um, towards St Catherine's Court. But very quickly on this issue of sustainability, I mean, I it's a big word and I, I don't claim to um, practice in a way that is, um, uh, in any way approaching anything like zero carbon, because it's kind of impossible. But I think the interest in, my interest in sustainable issues came from studying in Australia with an um, architect called Glenn Merkert, who showed me the sort of sensitive, extraordinary ways that farmers could locate the simplest and the most frugal of buildings that's, that knew exactly where they were. So this barn, of course, on the left-hand side is a barn that turns its back to the weather. So the wind uh, doesn't ever drive in from the east. The farmer knew that the wind doesn't come in from the east. They could have an opening to the east. And then his other buildings, of course, are designed to have um, strategies for storing grain, allowing the moist air to come over the top and to dry the grain. And those kind of simple, very direct buildings were the buildings around us you know, when we were building. So these are the kind of sheds and our pallet was the pallet of materials on the right hand side, which is corrugated a roof sheet and um, and timber. I mean, you know, steel, for what it's worth, has an extraordinary carbon footprint. I mean, I think the biggest change anyone can make in any building, if you're interested in embodied energy, which we should be, because 80% of a building now is embodied energy, rather than 20 years ago, 20%. Um, steel has an extraordinary carbon footprint. So, but plywood and Wrigley tin were our, were our materials. So, you know, we did something very simple. This was the track that we had to carry everything down. And I think what was interesting, again, from an environmental perspective, there was every single thing we consumed had to be carried by hand up and down this track, you know. So every bit of waste back up, every bit of food, every bit of material, everything had to come down that woodland track in a wheelbarrow. The diagram of the house was um, what I knew then, and I think this is a diagram to explain how much has changed in, you know, 20 years. So the diagram then was one I inherited from an, a, a, an Australian model of architecture where I had studied, and you know, they would touch the ground very lightly with tiny little footings that meant the water table was undisturbed and the big ash tree could still um, receive water so that it wouldn't, um, the, clay, the, the clay, the highly shrinkable clay wouldn't dry out. Um, we wanted a piece of house that was completely 
completely transparent so you could see all the way through it down uh, down the valley and that meant in a way there was too much glass um, historically um, above that we wanted privacy so there are the slats that you can see out of and people can't see in from the woods and then we had a clerestory that allowed the first chink of morning sun to come in and heat up the bedrooms with a kind of reverse eaves that gave us a buffer zone and a protected area on the northeast of the south rather than the of the house rather than the southwest because the big ash tree gave us that shade so um the the house section as it was then was designed in a kind of Walter Siegel-esque way where it was an incredibly crude and simple timber frame and again timber we could carry down we could work it on site um, and uh, because of the sections it was all unseasoned timber which of course environmentally then was a disaster for the last uh, 20 years because of course it shrank and moved and it was almost uncontrollable in how it moved and how it began over time to let the weather in but it's an incredibly simple express timber frame and all the things I cared about I guess as a young architect you know this notion of kind of expressing the frame I mean kind of absurd meaningless things in architecture in some ways expressing what you know but it meant that because of my sort of concerns about doing some kind of didactic building the building was not airtight and had far too too much glass and let um, uh, the weather in and couldn't keep the heat in, couldn't keep the cold out. And in some senses, it was a house for an optimist who assumed that the weather was always going to be good. But of course, the weather was always horrendous and it kind of drove in at us, for, you know, uh, 70 miles an hour for many years. But very simply, the old building is on the right hand side, the new building is on the, the left hand side. And we built as much as we could, as cheaply as possible. So we were only allowed to build a certain amount of footprint because we we're in Greenbelt. That was the maximum area we could build. So we slipped, we spread it out across the site, made it transparent so you could see through it. Then upstairs just had flexible partitions that we could move around. And the timber frame in some ways was the investment and the knowledge that that would last and everything else could be replaced over years. So we, uh, as Vanessa said, I you know, built it myself um, when I was setting up the practice, just with kind of people helping kind of when they could, um, farmer doing the foundations, us then making the first timber frame. Um, the only mechanical uh, object that came up was the uh, crane came up through the field. Um, and that's us then, you know, putting the frame up. And the reason I'm showing you this frame is to show again, so that ring beam that you're gonna hear me talk about is, is going back to that on the on the, the ring beam that is at ground level and at first floor level and actually also eaves level is the beam that I expressed and sat uh, most of the cladding or windows on um, and then the floor sat within that um, and you know then we never talked about a floor and a wall and a roof being a continuous thing we talked about elemental u values we talked about walls floors roof we never talked about air timers we talked about passive solar and we talked about um, ventilation. We didn't talk about the two things really that we need to talk about, which is super insulation and, of course, air tightness. Then, of course, how do you deal air wise with those things? But we know that's another thing. So this is the frame going up. Those ring beams that became the problem, became the nightmare in some ways. Small, you know, very lightweight components uh, fitting between. This is the context looking towards uh, uh, Salisbury Hill, you know, and then so this is my naive kind of studenty attempt to kind of weather tight um, a piece of highly shrinkable timber, which ended up um, moving and allowing um, weather in. And the house, um, you know, was great on a summer's day, but began to perform very badly um, relatively quickly. I mean, I would say um, it, it became a real problem problem for me and all I could see was how badly built the house was so in a way the conceit here is that everything should be expressed what's in tension what's in compression what the pin connector is um, what the timber is doing what the flashing is doing what the cladding is doing but of course you know um, that is designed to let whether it, it's designed as a discontinuous layer because in a way I prioritized um, you know the architectural concerns of expression over just getting a building to perform this is one of our children then, that's that same child on the right now, to give you an idea of where we are now and how much has changed. So this is then finishing that building many years ago, showing you how much glazing there was, and, and that is a huge problem. Although conceptually, it had been designed to show that we needed 
shade where we needed shading because of the big ash we had solid where we could have transparent because of the shading we had transparent but of course the ash tree actually died and of course we were left with a house that had far too much glass got far too hot um, except in winter when the solar gain was fantastic but you can see here it's a set of components a, a roof that is separate from the wall which also is separate from the floor and all of those things began to let the weather in and to many people, it was kind of imperceptible. But to me as an architect, it was kind of like one of my children had rickets. I'd, I'd, I'd neglected it, hadn't, hadn't kind of conceived to look after it. I hadn't found a way that this building could survive in this context. And it really began to kind of eat away at me. It was super cheap, though. The building was incredibly cheap. So actually, in hindsight, you know, of course, it was far cheaper for all those years than renting something. But it was super lightweight because everything needed to be carried down. Everything was designed to be as lightweight as possible. But the wind as it came in from from 90 miles an hour battered it and battered it and battered it and everything just started to decay around us I mean, to give you a sense of the weather also internally I mean, again you can see that i prioritized in the floor the ground floor i mean the absurd conceit prioritizing kind of the expression of a piece of timber beam in the floor when of course air eventually found its way around that so what we've done and i'll show you a slide in a minute is overclad the floor and put more insulation underneath and effectively connect the floor to the wall to the roof the heating, incidentally, I mean, how do you heat a house that has no car access? I mean, it's it's a really interesting thing back in, you know, when we couldn't afford 20 years ago to be autonomous. And everything that, you know, we, we inherited the old building with a, with a gas combi boiler, with gas bottles that had to be carried down uh, a path to heat a boiler. I mean, absurd. So we put in a wood fire, you can see the, the barrier full of wood. We, 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 when we bought the woods 10 years later, we then effectively had a free source of wood, but we'd put in a wood fired back boiler that heated all the radiators in a very old fashioned way. Um, but it is incredibly labor intensive. I mean, we get through, got through, 40 cubic meters a year, which I had to split and stack and bring in, you know, and that's the amount of wood typically that would burn in one fire a day. So, you know, and in the intervening period, just very quickly to bring you up to speed, I mean, I built the house, bought the woods, and then we built, you know, the studio out of our own timber. And my knowledge around timber and detailing, this is the studio inside, my knowledge around detailing and air tightness um, and buildings that were super responsive became um, much more um, uh, sort of detailed, I guess, you know, built another little workshop. Uh, built my, a house for my eldest daughter, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All of these intervening experiments began to perform so much better than the house. The studio actually performs really well. This house uh, for my daughter performs really well as well. Gives you a sense of the kind of how these winds come up the Bristol Channel and bash into us. So this is where we are now. What we did at this time last year, we were retrofitting the house. Finally, we had time. I'd worked out how we could keep the things that were good about the building and get rid of the things that weren't and effectively make it perform and make it much less labor intensive and much less low energy to um, to heat. So the yellow areas are where we added insulation in all of the walls and added, uh, kept the internal linings and just went out from there by another 350 mil or so and just made sure that everything was wrapped over. So those yellow sketches are where everything was wrapped over everything else, sealed all the gaps, taped, taped all the gaps and um, made sure that um, we got, uh, you know, U values that were effectively close to super insulation of 0.1 uh, everywhere um, and taped. I mean, here you can see now the beginnings of a building where internally the, the linings were kept. Upstairs, we took away large expanse of, of glass and had smaller holes in walls instead, which meant that the wall could connect to the uh, to the roof and so on. But you can see, of course, that the, the insulation there is continuous. These are in, this is insulation between studs, but also insulation on the top of studs that goes over the top of everything. I mean, incredibly obvious to us now. So this is, you know, that silver then sits on top of this. So this is, of course, insulation and studs that sit outside the existing stud work. So that internally, there is still stud work and insulation in between. There is actually rock wool in between, another layer of studs inside and tri -ISO super 10 and a lining that remained in place that was plywood. Outside that, we added new studs, new uh, mineral wool, and then new phenolic insulation all over the top of, of that. 
So this is what we're doing. You can see similar elevation again with more layers of insulation, took out all of that glass on the north side, took out the clerestory, because again, you cannot depend on passive solar in this country. I mean, it, it is either too hot or if it isn't too hot, you're too cold. So we have much more selective um, uh, gla glazing. I mean, upstairs, I think we reduced the glazing by over 50%. And actually, it's still really light and still works really well. And also, critically, we increased the potential to um, cross vent. So this is where we are now. And as you can see, instead of a building that's expressive with kind of ring beam that runs around at uh, midpoint at the first floor level and at the clerestory level and at the roof level, that also runs around on three sides, it now is, is a, it's effectively a thick duvet um, over the top and underneath everything. I mean, all very obvious to people. I mean, the interesting thing is, I suppose, only that we did it to a building that had been built 20 years previously, and uh, we did it with as little disruption as possible. We were still living in the house, which I think is interesting. So we, when we did this, uh, it was in, we were in lockdown, <laughs> no one was in school, um, and uh, I was working from home of all here, you know, and, and and we we did we obviously the, the sorry there there is also new glazing everywhere which is uh, twice as good as it was so same window system same window fitters from twenty years ago slightly updated window system same manufacturer but the glass is is literally twice as good and then on the uh, in the kitchen on the floor on the, on the whole of the ground floor we then um, overclad the uh, existing floor with more insulation, raise the floor up uh, by putting more insulation on and then put um, a new floor on top of that. We put electric heating, curiously, in the kitchen uh, on the whole of the ground floor because electric heating is obviously very expensive to run. The idea is that we don't use it very much, but it is, we have PVs on the roof to compensate. And actually there's a sensor in the floor, which shows that at the moment, sorry, in winter, it was only dropping by half a degree a day if we didn't have any heating on and the in-floor heating would hardly kick in because we are still using you know, wood um, for various things, the old house. So this is actually, sorry, just to go back to this, this is as it is, and you can see the kind of, you know, everything is overclad and actually here you can see as it was. So it's really interesting for me to see the difference between those two pictures, you know, expressive building, or unexpressive building. I mean, in a way I tried to banish all of the architectural conceits of my relative youth, you know, 20 odd years ago. And of course the installation now wraps over that timber ring beam and into the top of the window and seals all those joints. Um, and then, you know, we had to pull all the deck off to wrap down past the other ring beam on the ground. You can see next to the deck wraps it and underneath again and over the top of the, um, the floor there. Um, and uh, again, cladding coming down and wrapping into the top of the window head to protect all of that. Um, uh, there is this uh, gutter, but underneath that, the roof and the wall are seamless and, and um, uh, connected. So much of, you know, this is as it was, that's as it is. Um, and, you know, I've been accused of making the building less sexy, maybe, but, you know, it's a lot nicer to live in here. And I like, um, in a way, uh, less architecture around me, curiously, not more. That shows the floor that we overclass. So the existing, I mean, the absurd beams that were expressed with floors that sat between it. We then went over the top, as I said, with in, uh, uh, insulation, electric heating, a new uh, floating oak floor with um, PVs on the roof uh, as well. So that's as it was, you know, the, the kind of uh, transparency express ring beam, weather coming in below the ring beam, weather coming in above the ring beam, um, then all that glass on the north side, absurd. Um, this ring beam that runs around at clerestory level, letting weather in, the glazing above, um, designed to warm the rooms, um, of course, never really worked and just let heat out. So we got rid of that, cut off those eaves extensions and just wrapped everything um, like this. So it now, um, you know, we've had one winter in the building uh, and it performs really well. Um, you know, we burn about a third as much wood as we used to. We, um, the old house, curiously, is um, the bit now with 500 mil thick walls, even with a well insulated roof and, you know, put new windows in the old building. The old building now is the problem. The cat flap is the problem and we're chasing uh, drafts around in the old building at the moment. Um, so this is new kitchen, still the same old cluster. I mean, that's interesting to see now. Those are watermarks that water had found its way in and down that column from 
uh, the previous incarnation of the building. You know, so that post is behind that one of my daughters, Lily. On the right hand side, you can see water tracking down there. The column closest to us, you can see water tracking down there. I mean, actually having a building that you can enjoy being in a 90 mile an hour wind, is, wind in is a real um, uh, pleasure. So this is again, as it is, uh, as it was, you know, completely different building in some ways. Um, but it is going now, I hope, to um, survive uh, the weather, but also um, allow us to enjoy uh, being here in winter rather than wanting to, to sort of flee um, this place. So this is again new, oh yes, added a new radiator into the kitchen actually is again, uh, again all obviously still wood fired. You can see the thickness of some of the walls now, I mean the walls are now 450 thick, um, looking out, uh, very deep reveals now, which I like. I mean, actually, I also never liked the old part of the uh, first, the first floor, the new part of, you know, the, sorry, the 20 year old part of the first floor. There was too much glass. I didn't like sleeping in there. It was, it was too um, uh, sort of open, you know, and I, and I think that's really a real kind of eye opener for me. Um, architecturally, you know, these are kind of winter evenings, you know, summer dusks, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's where we are now. Um, I hope I haven't gone on too long and delighted if anyone would like to ask me a question that isn't too techy, that's more to do with the sort of general principles of what I've done, um, rather than any uh, figures that you might want from me. Thanks, Piers. That was um, not only inspirational and beautiful, but remarkably honest. Um, it sort of struck me that you were living in the architectural equivalent of looking at a photograph of yourself in flares. That, you know, one, 20 years ago, you thought they were the most fabulous trousers. And yeah. that you, you kind of lived in this piece of architecture and learned about its shortcomings as, as time has passed, which isn't... And I guess there's this idea that architecture arrives at, as a perfect thing and as a sort of masterpiece that shouldn't be touched or changed. And I think what was refreshing about your retrofit is that you kind of learned, you learned about the building probably the, the hard way. I mean, yeah. how, how was, how did you learn? And about well, it's really, it's really, I mean, that is the question. I mean, I think that, you know, when, when you're young, building anything is exciting. And I was really excited to build something for ourselves. I mean, we didn't have much money and we bought this site very cheaply. We had a finite and fixed amount of money to do something. So I guess initially there was a relief that we'd done something that gave us a little bit more space. And then, um, you know, as it was so hard building it, I mean, building anything at the end of a track was a nightmare. Um, and, you know, every time anything was delivered, coaxing those pieces of glass up and down the track, all that kind of thing. But then gradually I began to get far more real experience within my own practice delivering buildings that worked. And I became you know, much more interested in things that were perhaps more ordinary. And I think that you know, I likened the house in some ways to a kind of bad A-level essay. I mean, living with my own naiveties and deficiencies became really hard. And it isn't a building that was kind of beautifully out of style and it wasn't like a record that I'd made 20 years ago that was still kind of interesting even though it was out of it it actually just didn't work and and I think that you know what I have realized I think is that you don't need to prioritize one thing over the other and there I was incredibly keen to overthink every single connection and every single detail regardless of how it performed and I and I and now it isn't a question of prioritizing just the way it performs because otherwise you just have a good performing building rather than a piece of architecture I am still interested in light and daylight and transparency and being in the woods and feeling a connection to this site which is why of course the kitchen still has too much glass but, but I think also I really wanted the building to have a kind of dignity through being intelligently designed. And I just feel previously it just wasn't intelligently designed. And that really became to torment me. I mean, I really felt tortured by, I hated people seeing, I hated people coming to the house. And now I kind of don't mind it. It's a, it's a little bit homespun. It's, it's very low key in some ways. And, um, and I, and I, and I, you know, but I don't mind it. It's it, 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 in a way that I minded, I hated the old building and I, and I wanted to kill it off. And I'm glad that I did. It looked great in photos. It won awards and things, but I, it's like, I didn't, I, I had no attachment to keeping any of the old. I just wanted to make it something 
completely new, you know. Yeah, well, I think it's been very successful and it looks beautiful. I mean, I guess that's the problem with building your own house. It's a calling card as yeah. an architect and one that you can't kind of avoid being held responsible for. In a, in a I mean, it's interesting. Way. I went yesterday to a building that had been built 20 years ago, equivalently. And I have to say that's aged really badly as well. And I, and I think one of the problems with a lot of contemporary architecture is that they don't deal with time. In a, mm. in a very satisfactory way. And it was a gallery and it had big air gaps, weather came in um, because of course they didn't want to see seals between a piece of flush glazing and a door. Things that were flush were moving around. You could see where weather was coming in. I thought, God, I'm not alone in this actually. And actually, you know, you go back to visit a lot of those old modern masters that are still super interesting. None of them performed, none of them worked. They were all environmental and constructional disasters. So I think, you know, uh, and, and I think there is a lesson to us as contemporary architects in that how we deal with time. And I think that, you know, we're going to talk about sustainability. Buildings need to last. I mean, it, but now embodied energy is the issue that we need to solve. Generally, we can all do buildings that perform well quite easily in a relatively benign climate. But dealing with buildings that last is really important. And that's something I still feel we're not that good at architecturally. Yes, and I guess technology is changing. I mean, yeah. someone was asking a question about sort of heat pumps. Mm -hmm. And I think all of those things are sort of almost new, a new language that we're yeah. having to learn, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And timber's definitely having a moment as a material. Is. I mean, heat, heating is a really interesting thing. I mean, of course, you know, now you shouldn't heat a house. I mean, if you, you know, if you design a new building, a new house, you, you know, when someone asks you how should you heat it, the question, the answer is, of course, you shouldn't need to heat it because you can design buildings that are so efficient, the only heating you need is the heat that you recover. Um, one of the things that we do struggle with is, you know, now the house is airtight, how do you deal with air change? And of course, mm -hmm. you, know, you deal with it by opening a window and of course you let all that cold air in and that is a problem. So it's a problem not having an MBHR actually, but every new building that we do does have an MBHR. Um, probably um, we should have put an MBHR into this house. I mean, there are still things I would like to do, such as draw hot air from various bits of the house with internal fans to take them into the old bit. We still find ourselves in uh, summer evenings in the old house when it gets cold, lighting a fire, whereas I could just take some of the warm air from the new house and move air around. So I think, you know, technology has got so much better at, at not assuming we even need a heat pump. We can just use the heat we already have. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, technology um, or, or building envelope design has changed so much. I mean, the exponential kind of change in building envelope design has been extraordinary, really. Yeah, and I think your most of the comments that are coming through chat, the chat um, option on Zoom actually is saying, thank you for a really inspirational mm. and honest talk, because it's rare actually, I think, to hear architects talk about that issue of time mm. and buildings sort of failing over time. And I think there is a, as you said, there's a desire in architecture to sort of be invisible, which actually it seems that Invisible Studio is, is not trying to deny the architectural no. detailing that makes our houses more. No, well, I think, you know, I look across the valley at that house, St. Catherine's Court, and it's an Elizabethan house. It has no beginning, no end. It has multiple hands. It's changed constantly over mm -hmm. 500 years, and it's much the better for it. And I think that buildings that aren't designed to change are generally incredibly banal, you know, and I think even Bath, it's a world heritage site, it's four miles down the road, every building has been changed and adapted in very kind of, you know, uh, relaxed manners. And I think that's really interesting. And it's very easy to change an old building. It's not as easy to change a new building. They kind of resist it because we think of them as complete static things that are photographed and it has to be forever like the thing in the photograph. But really, life isn't like that, you know. And I, and I think buildings, you know, Stuart Brand wrote a fantastic book, of course, which is how buildings learn, you know, um, the failure of, of fixing a building, you know. So in your contracts, could you put a clause in saying you have to go back in 20 years time? <laughs> See I, think, yeah. nice timing up. I think it's interesting. I mean, I think buildings, even if you don't, I mean, I think the thing is when you, well, certainly I think we design buildings now that can change. They're less mm -hmm. fixed. They're more um, able to change either conceptually or practically. And, um, you know, we've done a very big building or series of buildings recently in Somerset. There's a gallery and a series of spaces that's opened this summer. That's designed to allow people to come along and infill and change and develop. And it's kind of robust enough for other someone else to come in and, and, and do something. But even, even houses or buildings or schools, whatever, that we've designed that other people change despite what we had wanted to do. 
in a way, I, I love seeing, I love seeing life take over. You know, it's always a relief when life, life takes over. People have the confidence to make it theirs and forget about what we did. And I think that when we finish the building, it's not the end, it's the beginning of the building's life. And it's really great to see buildings take on their own life, you know. I think that's a very beautiful place to end actually at the beginning. Okay. Um, so I wanna say a massive thank you, Piers. And to say to everyone watching that the Building Centre is open, we're also fans of timber here. We've got a great exhibition on called Conversations About Climate Change with the Timber Trade Federation. Um, so come along, Piers, join us for a coffee. Everyone else is more than welcome to, to come along too. So we look forward to seeing what you're up to next, Piers, and where, where you're gonna be traveling to. Uh, thank you so thank much you. for sharing your wonderful house with us and the story of um, change and optimism and architecture. So yeah, thanks from us at the Building Center. Thanks for having me. Take Bye, care, everyone. pleasure. Bye. Bye.